Hello and welcome to the Friday, October 30th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. So yesterday I mentioned that we did see first exploit attempts against our WebLogic honeypots using CVE 2020-14882. This is a vulnerability that was patched about a month ago as part of Oracle's quarterly critical patch update. The only activity that we have observed so far is just testing the vulnerability, but it is actually trying to exploit it. Uh, for example, triggering a DNS lookup and not installing any code or running any malicious commands other than whatever is required to trigger the DNS lookup. What is however interesting also is that around noon today, the exploit activity has ceased at least against our honeypots. We identified about uh, three or four different entity it seemed like based on the exploits being used. Now they all use the same basic exploits, but everybody said they had their own uh, little uh, trick how they probed for vulnerable systems. So we can only assume that by now they're done scanning the internet and well, uh, maybe they'll come back and launch actual exploits against systems that they found to be vulnerable. What's a little bit odd is that the exploit activity really has sort of completely stopped over the last few hours. Typically with something that's so easy to exploit, we tend to have plenty of script kitties that go after these systems. Maybe it'll take them a couple more days to get this exploit integrated into whatever kit they're using. But well, um, the advice remains patch, patch as fast as you can. If you are running a web logic, we tested these exploits against our own web logic setups and it's extremely trivial to get code execution, read arbitrary files and essentially uh, do whatever you need to do to the server. And if you're using Checkpoint's Zone Alarm, the personal firewall that sort of has in the last years morphed into an endpoint security solution, Checkpoint got an update for you. Uh, this update fixes a couple of privilege escalation vulnerabilities. Nothing super serious, uh, but uh, definitely want to stay up to date in your security software. And of course, there has been a lot of news about ransomware apparently targeting healthcare institutions and hospitals. Well, over the last year and so, there were multiple hospitals that got hit badly by ransomware. There are even at least one death that's sort of attributed to ransomware. However, the Sonar Source blog is reporting about four new vulnerabilities in Open EMR. EMR stands for Electronic Medical Records, which is a somewhat popular open source application to essentially store patient data. There are a total of four vulnerabilities that can be used in order to execute arbitrary code on the server. So this is a vulnerability that's certainly uh, going to be targeted and uh, looked after by people trying to attack healthcare institutions. If you are running open EMR, please, please update and uh, make sure that these systems are, if possible, not directly accessible from the outside. Proof of concept, exploit code has been released and it's uh, pretty trivial to exploit uh, these vulnerabilities. And then of course, we are just one weekend away from the presidential election here in the United States and we have not really seen much of any sort of election interference at this point, uh, really some smaller things, but just as a reminder that probably anything that you hear this weekend or early next week should probably not influence the decision on who you vote for. Also, one of the most vulnerable parts in the anti-election process are probably the early results that you may see on Tuesday. So let us know if you here see anything interesting. 
Well, it's Friday again, and uh, with me today I have Mishka McCohen, another STI student. Uh, Mishka, could you please introduce yourself? Sure thing. Mishka McCowan, I am in the very tail end of my progress through the STI program. Just have a, a few things to wrap up, and I will have that degree to post proudly on my wall. Well, uh, that's exciting. <laughs> and you just uh, did your research paper, too, which, you know, of course, sort of one of the final things that uh, most people do as part of the program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your research paper? Like, what was this all about? My research paper was about looking at the efficacy of the controls outlined in the Cloud Security Alliance's top 12 vulnerabilities for serverless. So let me tell you just a little bit of background about it. Serverless was introduced really in about 2014 by AWS with their Lambda service. It has come up repeatedly, you know, in, in obviously in trade rags, in industry publications, and in my own work at, at my organization. So what I decided was that it would be good to look into sort of the frameworks that were out there for, uh, for securing these types of things. But what I found was there, there were two main ones. There was the OWASP top 10 for serverless that was released at, at the end of 2018. And there was the Cloud Security Alliance uh, set of 12 vulnerabilities that was released at the very beginning of 2019. Those two really form the basis of what is, of the literature that's out there for securing serverless applications. And what I, I ended up choosing the Cloud Security Alliance top 12 serverless vulnerabilities because I felt that they, they had uh, a few that were very specific to cloud that were, that were very, uh, would, would be very useful. And of course, you know, 12 is always better than 10. And I felt I got better, more for my money's worth. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Now, uh, serverless, of course, the big selling point is you no longer have any servers to maintain. That's sort of implied in uh, the name. Uh, do a lot of the server-related vulnerabilities fall away as well? Uh, like, you know, for example, patching and passwords and uh, network controls, or how does it really compare uh, to deploy your software serverless? versus deploying it you know, in a server, whether that server is in the cloud or on-premise? One of the things that we, we became very clear to me as I started working on this is that you have to be very aware of where your provider's shared responsibility model comes into play. For instance, I, I focused on Lambdas with AWS. In that model, AWS will take care of the patching of the Lambda itself. So the container that it's running in, they will secure and they will patch and they will keep up to date. However, you are responsible for any, you know, the code that is running there. You are responsible for any third-party libraries that are running there. So it can still be a very secure, hardened uh, container. However, if you introduce something with a library that has a vulnerability, that is your responsibility to patch and maintain. It is not AWS's responsibility. I think that is the number one thing that comes out of this is you need to be, be aware of where that big bright line is between what is your responsibility and what is AWS's responsibility or whomever your cloud provider is. Many times out there, what you see is that people will say things like it's it's secure because it's you know, AWS or the cloud provider will take care of the underlying server. And that's that is partially true. You have a responsibility as well. Yeah, so, and I guess uh, the same applies to credentials as well. If these are credentials that you introduce, for example, to authenticate to your Lambda or credentials used by your Lambda to connect to other services, kind of up to you to uh, keep those credentials uh, secure. Absolutely. How you how you maintain those credentials, that is, that is your choice. AWS will, to, for lack of a better term, will give you enough rope to hang yourself. You can, for instance... If you want, put them in as a as an environmental variable inside the lambda itself. That is not recommended. It's more recommended that you that you use some sort of secrets management rather. But that is up to you. AWS is not going to force you to do one or the other. So you have to have in your application development environment enough controls in place to ensure that it is being done correctly by your developers. And yeah, you know, the other side, sort of, of Amazon maintaining uh, this Lambda infrastructure. Any risks there that uh, they may inadvertently break your code because they don't necessarily understand what your code is doing. They may indeed break something with with the patching. However, in my experience, in my fairly limited experience in running them in my own environment, we haven't had a problem with that. What it what tends to be more of a problem is a bit of bit rot because AWS will, for whatever language you are writing this in, be it, be it Node or Python or something else, 
they will um, they will support it for a certain period of time, and then when they end of life, it they will it will remain active. However, they will they will cease to to sort of patch it at that point and and, and maintain it, and then eventually they will force you to you know to actually upgrade to the next version, be it you know the next version of Python or the next version of Node or whatever. So you do have to be careful of sort of they will enforce upon you a certain life cycle uh, based on the supported version of the language that you're using. And I assume they're not uh, too aggressive there. Like I'm just thinking about you know, Python 2.7, for example. And a lot of organizations are struggling with uh, getting rid of old uh, Python 2.7 code. And if you run it on-premise, it's not really a big deal to still keep Python 2.7 around. You know, most Linux distributions still, still support it, then uh, no big problem. But if Amazon would offer some decide, hey, you know, uh, no more Python 2.7 here, uh, then you better get moving on trend on transforming your code. Absolutely. And and that's not just Python. Um, you know, Python is something, you know, that obviously going from two to three is a large one. So there, there's a large window there. But for let's say node, because that is a much more aggressive schedule that they have for you know, having things that are an LTS versus end of life, that tends to move much more rapidly. And so if you are on node 10 today, uh, you should be eyeing node 12, you know, to make sure that you stay current with that as they move, you know, through their life cycle, because it's much shorter in that respect. So once we take this, you know, bright red line that you sort of uh, talked about here into account where our responsibility starts, uh, we're really sort of left with, application vulnerabilities uh, what are sort of the one two or three sort of top issues that you're discussing here in your paper well there were really three that i chose for my paper so out of the 12 what i chose was were injection attacks uh insecure serverless deployment configurations and then overprivileged functions i chose those three uh for two reasons one they were they were towards the top of the list of uh the uh, CSA's list of top 12. And second, uh, what I was using to test is a is an application from OWASP called the Serverless Goat, an, in, an, an intentionally insecure application that is used for testing and learning. And what I did was I took each of those vulnerabilities and I looked at first exploiting them. So it had, you know, for the injection attack, for example, I, I found a command injection vulnerability in it that I was able to exploit to, to great effect. Um, and then I went through and I've remediated it to see how effective that remediation could be. So just to, just to summarize, yes, all of these things come into play, the things that you would think of, injection attacks, you know, configuration attacks, et cetera. Uh, those are all very much in play for a serverless application. Is the mitigation very similar to when you're uh, deploying applications in a traditional environment? Like, do you do your code scanning? Do you do your prepared statements to prevent some of the injection attacks or anything uh, particular different about serverless? Yes and no. Yes to things, you know, to the techniques that you would use, things like validating your input. You know, the, the things that would be recommended in your traditional OWASP top 10 list are very effective in, in remediating these things in serverless. However, you mentioned code scanning, which is interesting because the code scanning ecosystem specifically for Lambdas is much thinner than it is in other places uh, for, you know, for let's say a traditional on-premise uh, sort of uh, environment um, that it's just the tooling is, is having to catch up. So for something like that, there are, there are a few out there. Uh, some of it, uh, some of your traditional tools will, will take a stab at it, but they are not as, as fully developed as you would see in other, uh, other uh, application development environments. So that's great. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, telling us about this. Of course, a link to the paper will be in the show notes. Now, you told me that uh, you know, you'll, you're almost done with uh, your decree. Uh, any plans on what you'll be doing with all that free time that you'll be having once you're done? <laughs> uh, I, in truth, I haven't much thought about it. Um, <laughs> it it's... it's uh... It's required so much focus that, you know, wanting to make sure that I, I stay on track and keep on top of everything, yep. you know, keep keep cranking out the pages for the paper, et cetera. I haven't, I haven't stopped to think how I'm going to treat myself when I'm done. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Thanks again for joining me here. Thanks, everybody, for listening and uh, talk to you again on Monday.